Joining us today on the podcast is Annie Duke. She wrote this terrific book called Thinking in Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. This is what it looks like if you're looking on the video. And uh, Annie is interesting. You know, oftentimes on this podcast, we're looking for people who have practical experience as well as interesting theoretical backing. And Annie has both. She was uh, a professional poker player, having won over $4 million in tournaments. She earned a World Series of Poker bracelet, which I don't really know anything about, but it sounds impressive. <laughs> and, uh, and now she's retired from poker and has done her graduate level research in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. She's authored a bunch of books. And she's really an expert both in practice and in theory around making decisions large and small. So I'm really excited to, as someone who's a little indecisive myself, to have her on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Annie, welcome to the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thanks for having me. So Annie, um, give us big picture about like why you wrote this book, what this, what this, you know, what the general underlying important idea behind the book is. So uh, yeah, I would say that the important idea behind the book is that there's a lot of uncertainty in what we do. And we kind of try to jam life's decisions into the into the chess model, uh, but it actually belongs much more kind of at the poker table. Um, and, and that's just because there's a lot of uncertainty in, first of all, how good our beliefs are, because there's lots and lots of information that we don't have, so no belief is informed by perfect information. And there's a lot of uncertainty also just in, in how the future is going to turn out because there's lots of luck involved, right? So, you know, the simple thing is you can go through a red light and you can get through fine. You can go through a green light and you can get in a car accident and you can imagine what happens when we complicate those decisions. That's a pretty simple decision. So, Although um, it wouldn't lead us to a decision to say ignore lights because there's still like a preponderance of the evidence that suggests that you'll be safer going through green lights than red lights. So that's kind of actually, I really appreciate you saying that because that's actually where the problem lies. So in something like whether we go through green lights or red lights, that's pretty settled. And the quality of that decision is pretty transparent. But when we get away from, from something like red lights and green lights and we get into things that are uh, much more complicated, like should I change careers or what strategy should I implement or that kind of thing, the, the decision itself isn't settled law. So we actually... Uh, end up when things aren't transparent, like the traffic light decision is it is we tend to make this mistake called resulting, which is we take the quality of the outcome, whether it's good or bad, and we use that as a signal to try to decide whether the decision quality itself was good or not. And that does actually ca cause us to get confused about what kind of lights we're supposed to go through. So, um, and that that's just because like we can think about the that. I can make a good decision and have a good result or a bad result because of luck and hidden information. Right. And I can make a bad decision and I can have a bad or a good result. But in chess, if I lose to you, we kind of know why. It's because I didn't play as well as you did. And that's because you're removing a lot of that luck and a lot of the hidden information piece because I can see where all your chess pieces are. Mm -hmm. So basically what happens is that when we're – just kind of confused about whether a decision is good or not, which is most of the complicated decisions that we make. If it doesn't turn out well, what do we do? Oh, it must have been a bad decision, or I should have known that that was coming. And if it turns out well, what do we do? We break our arms, patting ourselves on the back for how incredibly smart we were. And so it's the equivalent of going through a green light, getting through safely and saying, I'm a great driver. You know, it's interesting because... I, I want to parse this out and I want to go slowly here because it's really important. And I think this is so important also for perfectionists, right? For the people who right. perseverate over making the right decision. That in the end, I want to make this distinction and tell me if I'm making the right distinction. That when when I make a decision and the outcome doesn't turn out the way it should have, in that particular case, with that particular sets of circumstances – it might still be fair to call it a poor decision, but it wasn't necessarily born out of poor decision making. Meaning I may have made, I may have done everything right in terms, and it was the right decision given what we know, but it turned out to be an outcome that, 
you know, we made a decision that ultimately 60% of the time would have, would have born successfully. And so if that means that it's the right decision, because the other decision would have been 40% of the time. And then the chances are that the decision would have been a poor outcome. But in the end, in that situation, if it didn't pan out, maybe I'm just talking semantics here, but isn't that still a poor decision? No, it's not. It's not a poor decision. I think the idea is that uh, on one single try of any decision, uh, we don't really know. And what you're just trying to do is have a really good decision process. And the only poor decision is that is one that doesn't have a good process behind it, one that doesn't have really good thinking behind it, one that where you aren't trying to be really informed by the information that's at hand. I mean, what I would say is like, if I have a coin that's going to flip heads 90% of the time, and tails 10% of the time, and you say, hey, let's bet a dollar, and you get to call the coin. And if I call heads, and it happens to flip tails, which is only going to happen 10% of the time. It was still a good decision. It was a great decision. Right. Right? Right. I did something that was going to turn out 90% of the time. So I think particularly for perfectionists, yeah, getting rid of that, that idea that it's poor because it happened not to have worked out or that it's good because it happens to have worked out actually frees us up to be much more decisive because we aren't standing there afraid of the way it's going to happen that somehow after the fact we're going to have all this self-recrimination that we shouldn't have spe- we should have spent longer on the decision or that decision was bad just because it turned out poorly if we if we've been thoughtful in our process that's it and then you assume it will play out over time Annie this is why I was so excited to have you on the show cuz i i really love it and i think you know everybody sort of talks about accepting failure and pivoting and 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 you know it's th- this is this is the theoretical underpinning that allows people to do that which is to say you you really and also when people talk about focusing on the process and not the outcome it's like, you know, you're saying that to the nth degree, which is that if you're going to make a decision, it's all about process and ultimately the accumulation of a number of good, de- you know, of good decision making over time should pan out that you're making better bets and you're getting to the outcome more often, more frequently than you would if you're making a bunch of poor decisions. But, but good decisions uh, produce poor outcomes. Some of the time. Of course, some of the time that they do. And I also want to emphasize the other side of that coin because I think that it's an an equally large problem for people in how they sort of figure out like what what should they be repeating, like you know, what things were good about a decision or bad about a decision. So yes, a very, very good decision can have a very bad outcome. I can drive through that red light totally sober, following the speed limit you know, looking ahead of me and everything, and someone can just come through that intersection and hit me. Right. And that does not make it in any way, shape, or form a poor decision, right? Right. But I also just want to emphasize that you can make a really bad decision and have it turn out well. Right. And I think that people don't think about the problem of that side of the coin as much, which is that we can end up reinforcing a lot of behaviors and think that we're really good decision makers because life just happened to, like, you know, hand us a good outcome. Right. So it's kind of the equivalent of, I say, like, I mean, you could think about the disaster of thinking, oh, I'm going to be really afraid of green lights now. Right. So that's really bad if you happen to get in an accident. But isn't it really bad if you, you know, I've heard this before. I drive better when I'm drunk. <laughs> right. What a disaster. Right. So, so the thing is that you, you, you not only want to avoid being afraid of green lights, but you also want to avoid thinking that you drive better when you're drunk. Right. Because that's just going to produce a bad decision. That's a misconception right. that's going to produce a bad decision. And then trust me, you do that enough times and it's going to the, turn out The badly. statistics are going to play in. Right. They're going to play out um, I, either way. So let's take one step back. Define a good decision because it seems clear to me now, given what you've said, but I think it's useful to give us a sentence of like, here's what makes a good decision. So let me, I'm really happy you asked that. And I want to take a step back in terms of thinking about what's a good decision. Because I think that a lot of times as we're evaluating other people's decisions, we're thinking about what our own values are, Mm -hmm. right? So, So if somebody chooses a career that pays less money 
and we're people who value a high salary. Like we might look at them and think that that they made a poor a, decision, that they made a poor decision, right. but that's not taking into account what their values are. Right. So I think that's the first thing that we need to do is understand that people have different values. People have different resources that they can invest. People have different attitudes about risk, right? So you might be somebody who's like super entrepreneurial and totally willing to take like a lot of risk and understand that there might be a lot of downside, but then you, you also get like a lot of upside for that. And that, those are your values and you're happy doing that. Right. And other people might want that slow and steady, you know, wins the race. So this is the first part of what makes a good decision is really identifying what are your values? What is it that you're trying to accomplish and what, what are your goals? And that actually is something that people don't do very much of, by the way, surprisingly. As they're making decisions, they, they aren't thinking ahead to sort of what's the end point that I'm trying to get to and what are the things that I really value for myself. So that's the first piece is to identify your values, then to figure out what your own tolerance is for bad and good, right? Which is just risk, right? Like mm -hmm. how, how much do you want things to swing around on you? Mm -hmm. um, think about what your resources are. That you have that you have to invest. Um, think about your risk of ruin, and once you've sort of figured out all that stuff, which are sort of the component parts of like the nuts and bolts of what you are deciding about. Mm -hmm. Now, what you do is you think about what your options are. What are you deciding? What things are you deciding among? Mm -hmm. um, and then imagine what the futures are that could turn out from those options. Um, and now think about which up. Uh, given the, the, what you're trying to get in return and what uh, resources that you have to invest, what future is more likely to make you happy or sad? So I'll, I'll do this. In, like that was obviously very abstract. Let me give you like a super simple um, example. So you're in a restaurant and you're looking at a menu. Well, so we have all sorts of value things, right? Like, are you looking for like short-term happiness? So you would be willing to eat something that uh, might be unhealthy because that that's just what you want that day. That's a value question, right? Or are you someone who really values like long-term health? So let me, let me pause and already complicate yeah. the example, which is that I think the biggest challenge that we always have is um, competing values, right? So, right? so I really care about my health and I really like eating tasty food. So now I'm in that restaurant and I've got two values and both of those values, you know, and, and there's, and let's just say there's a, you know, pumpkin sesame quiche and a kale, you know, tempeh salad. And, right. you know, people might be listening to this and say, wow, both of those sound gross. But uh, to me, they both actually sound good. <laughs> and, and they both, and like one of them will taste better than the other. And one of them is going to be healthier than the other. And I care about both. Right. So in that particular case, what you're describing is actually uh, a competition between what your present self would enjoy and what your long-term self wants. Mm -hmm. So th this is actually a place where we very often have competition between our short-term self and our long-term self. Right. So what's actually really helpful in making decisions there is to do what's called pre-deciding. So in that particular case, when I wasn't around the food, I would say, what are, what are my long-term goals? Because this is what we're trying to get to is sort of realize the best version of ourselves. Right. So let's say that I said that my long-term goal was, um, so I'll make this black and white first. My long-term goal is that uh, I want to be the healthiest version of me. And so therefore, when I'm presented with difficult choices, I want to choose the kale. Right. So you make a commitment in advance. The best way to do that is to either, um, there's a variety of ways you can make that commitment for the future you that's gonna be sitting in the restaurant. One is to go to restaurants that only offer healthy foods. That's right. one way that you could do it. That kind of takes the decision out of your hands because you're only going to places that aren't gonna tempt you. Um, another is to make a rule for yourself so that each time you're presented with that decision, you're not making a new decision. So for example, in my case, I'm a vegan. Mm -hmm. That's a rule. Oh, and so both of my are... choices sounded very good to you. It right. was a vegan so, quiche with cashew butter. Okay, there you go. Yeah, I would like that. <laughs> So, so in this particular case, uh, I'm a vegan means that every time I'm presented with a steak on the menu, it's not a brand new decision you, for me. You, it's not a decision at all. It's not a decision at all. Exactly. Right. You can do things in the moment. Like, uh, for example, let's say you're, you, you're trying not to eat bread. You can say to the, to the waiter, don't, don't bring put bread on the table. Right. You can tell your friends, 
Right. This is a commitment that I'm making. So please don't do that. So that would be like a black and white way to, to deal with those competing values is to take some time when you're away from the decision to figure out how you weight those two yous. Right. The one who's in the middle of eating ice cream and the one who in the long run has eaten more kale. Right. Figure out which you is the goal for you. Um, and then set up pre-commit what are called pre-commitment contracts or Ulysses contracts around right. that. Now, sometimes you might say, I mostly want to eat kale, but sometimes I want to eat ice cream. And you can still set a pre-commitment up around that because what you can do is say, I eat kale every day but Sunday, and on right. Sundays I eat ice cream. Right. And again, you're just you're just making it so you can't fall down as much because you've set a rule around it. Right. Got it. Okay, perfect. I love it. Okay, so I interrupted you. So the first thing you do is you think about what your values are. Right. So what are my values? Am I trying to eat healthy or not healthy? Whatever it might be. Um, that's obviously going to narrow down the menu items for you. Um, how, how much money do I have to be able to order? How much space in my stomach do I have in terms of the number of things I could order? Because obviously right. it could be that you like 10 things on the menu, but you can't, if you order all 10, you have neither the money nor the space in your stomach. So that's a resource. That's a, the resources are limiting. You and know? that actually might be a pre-decision also, which is to say, if you wait until you're looking at the dessert menu to make that decision, it's going to be too late. So you right. say, okay, I'm going to go. And I know by, from history that if I order an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert, that's more than I would eat at home, and it's more than I'm going to leave comfortably with. Exactly. And it's this distinction between, you know, instead of eating what I want to eat, I want to eat what I want to have eaten, right? Which exactly. is that future self. And so then you look back and you go, okay, so I'm going to go to this restaurant, and I'm going to have one entree, and I'm going to have no dessert because it's not Sunday. So now I can just look at the entrees. I don't even have to look at the others, and then I can make my decision. If I'm vegan, I'm going to have two choices. Right, exactly. Right. So, right. So, so you have the influence of limited resources. So in this case, you could say money, uh, space in your stomach, time is also a limited resource. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I assume you can't sit in the restaurant for two hours trying to decide. Um, <laughs> and you don't have time to eat every single on thing on the menu, uh, a variety of things. And so you could set like a time limit, like I'm only going to take two minutes to decide right. off this menu. Right. Um, cause some people have trouble. They, they spend more time than they need to, and they're not good satisfied. Right. So now all you do is you look and you say, given my past experiences with these menu items and given my, maybe the, given my past experience with this restaurant, if you happen to have been in this restaurant before, I'm going to take a moment and say, which Annie is going to be happier? The Annie that's having the kale salad or the Annie that's having the quiche? Right. So you just ask yourself that question. Like you imagine which Annie. And, and I so think when Annie, you're like, asking the, the time frame in which you're asking yourself that question I'm hearing from you makes the biggest difference. So if you're asking that yeah. question from the Annie who's sitting in the restaurant versus the Annie who's just finished eating, you might have different answers and you have to make That's a exactly decision right. as to which Annie I'm going to ask. Right. So, so now you just say like, so now you're just doing some scenario planning, like which Peter is going to be happier. And then before you make the decision, just always ask, and it doesn't matter what decision it is, always ask yourself the following question. Is there some piece of information that would change my mind? So that I could find in the time out in the time frame that I have. So you've set yourself, say, like three minutes to decide. You're, you've decided that the Peter who eats the quiche is going to be happier. So now just stop and say, is there some piece of information that I could find out that would significantly change the decision that I'm going to make. Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, go ahead and do it. And guess what? Sometimes the quiche is going to suck. That's okay. You did your job. You made a good decision. You made right. your process. Sometimes the answer is yes. Like you could, when the waitress comes over or the waiter comes over, you can say to them, um, can I ask you a question? Like I'm trying to decide between the kale and the quiche. Is there like is there a clear choice here? Because maybe maybe the waiter or waitress. So like, let me ask you. I want to ask you about this because this is something that I've thought a lot about, and I've done right. I go to the waiter or the waitress and I go, you know, what should I order? This or that. That seems like and and it's and this is a challenge that we face in in an age where everybody has a review about everything, which is. The waitress and I are two totally different people with two totally uh -huh. different values and totally different perspectives. So I'm asking some random person who's not totally random because she works in the restaurant or he works in the restaurant, but, but they're going to make a decision that's right for them. And I'm taking all of the stuff I know about myself and none of it matters anymore. Right. So you can reframe the question so that it's not about what they like. You can say, uh, in like, in general, you find like, 
I, I think I have a decision, but all I'd like to know from you is do people really complain a lot about one of these items? Right. And even then, right. it's a little dangerous because you're finding out what other people are thinking about it. I mean, if you kind of look around at the restaurant yeah. and you say, well, there's a lot of people who seem like me, then that might be a more valid question to ask than if like everyone around you is looking very, very different than you and you're thinking they may not make the same decision that I would make. So that's true. So it's this kind goes of, it back is sort to that of stereotyping question that I said. Yeah, so profiling. this goes back to that, this question I said. Of what your is, values are. Is there is there a piece of information that I could uncover that would significantly change my mind? Right. So what I'm hearing from you is that what the waiter or waitress's opinion is, is not a significant enough piece of information for you as an individual to change your mind, but it might be for me. Right. So that's why you always ask yourself that. Like, is there something in particular that I could find out that would actually significantly change my mind that I could discover within the time frame that I'm going to, that I can decide. And here's the big kicker is to go into the decision process without the goal of being certain about your choice, but with the goal of having one choice be uh, a little bit more than the other one at minimum. Right. So your goal isn't to go into that and say, my goal is that I want to be a hundred percent sure that I'm picking the right item on the menu. It's I'm deciding between these two things and I'd like to be like, you know, 55, 45. Well, and you're also narrowing it down because when you just describe that as to say, I want to pick the right thing on the menu, there's a million things that can represent the right thing. But that's if you right. go in with that predetermined self that says, I want to pick something that's tasty enough and that's healthy. Right. Then you go, okay, well now, you know, I'm not just looking at the right thing. I'm looking at the right thing that fits these criteria and it becomes an easier decision. Right. And then what we can think about is this. So you're sitting there and you're trying to decide between the kale and the quiche and you get the quiche and it's gross. <laughs> and kale eating Peter is now in your head yelling at quiche eating Peter saying, why didn't you choose me? Right. And the answer is because 55% of the time quiche eating Peter was going to be happier, but I knew that 45% of the time kale eating Peter was going to be happier. So shut up because I already thought about you in advance. Right. right? So he, and yeah. it's this idea of like this, don't recriminate when it happens not to work out well, because what you're, you're going into that decision already knowing that 45% of the time you think you might be happier with the other choice. Right. So therefore, if it turns out that the quiche isn't as good as you thought, you aren't sitting there like beating yourself up. The other thing you're not doing is if it turns out the quiche is really excellent, you're not thinking, look at me, I'm so smart, I knew it for sure. Right. Because no, you thought that 55% of the time that was what was going to happen. So you're taking a tremendous amount of stress off right. of the decision-making process, which right. is super useful. Right. Let me ask and it you- makes, It makes you more decisive. Right. So, so people say to me all the time, they're like, well, if you're talking about all this uncertainty- doesn't that make you uncertain about your decisions? And I said, no, it actually makes you much more decisive because a lot of what's, what stops us from me being able to actually bank a decision, from being able to actually do it, is that we think we need to be 100% sure. And so there's people who are like trying to maximize every little piece of information, like they're shopping for a gift for their partner and they're looking at like 17,000 shoes <laughs> trying to find just the right one because right. they think that they need to be a hundred percent sure and know for sure that they have the very best one. And it makes you incredibly indecisive. It's what gets you into this analysis paralysis and this inability to decide when you say, I can never be sure of how the future is going to turn out. All I can do is make my best guess. It actually completely frees you up to be right. a much you know, much more decisive decision maker. Right. Right. And, and actually you're, you're reducing the bar from perfect to satisfied. Right. And, and there's a lot of research that shows that people who go for satisfied are a lot happier than people who go for perfect. Right. Exactly. So I'm curious about how this plays out with a bigger decision. So something like, you know, investing in stocks or, or meals, like those are decisions that we're making multiple times a day with meals. And so we could be wrong here or there. It doesn't make a difference. The biggest th thing we're risking is like a 20 buck entree. But, you know, if I'm thinking about my business and I'm thinking, okay, I have to decide if I'm going to frame what we do and, and, you know, plunk down tens of thousands of dollars on marketing 
to identify ourselves as a strategy execution firm or an executive coaching firm. And, and, and the implicate, it's not a decision I'm making every day, three times a day. It's a decision I'm making, you know, once every couple of years, and we're going to throw a bunch of resources behind this decision. Suddenly the stakes are much higher. The 55%, 45% consequences are much more dire. And the, the drive for perfection suddenly gets in the way of the drive for satisfaction because it could mean, you know, the success or failure of the business. Yeah. So I think that that's because you're feeling like it's the success or failure of the business. And that actually makes it much harder to decide, which increases the chance that you fail at the decision process. So I think, first of all, think about, try to think about all these decisions as the same. There's nothing that fundamentally different about trying to choose between the quiche and the kale as there is between choosing between two decision strategies. It's just that because it's higher stake, you probably want to make sure more that you're going through a really good process, right? right? Like, because we want to think about what's the downside consequences of missing something, right? Right. So you're right. If if you happen to not think it through very well and you get the wrong menu item, it's like, it's not such a big deal. So, so you don't have to go through a specific a process in order to get to where you are. So yeah. And the drive and the, the, the distinction between a 55, 45%, like a big de- a high stakes decision, I'd like it to be 70, 30 or 75, Why? 25. Why? Be- if it's an either, or if those are the two, if those are the two strategies that you have, Right. And you've gone through your process and you think that one is 55% and one is 45%. That's the much better strategy. It's uh, going to, it's going to win much more in the long run. But there's not a long run, meaning, meaning uh-huh. there's, there's, there's a long run in terms of how it plays out, but there's not a long run in terms of making a hundred of those decisions. Meaning if I'm making a hundred of those decisions, then the long run makes a big difference. If I'm talking about who I get married to a 55% to 45%, you know, I'm not going to get married a hundred times. And, and so maybe, you know, hopefully I'm not going to get married a hundred times. So like the preponderant, that 5% or 10% delta between, you know, a good decision and a bad decision, I, I, I get, I'm suddenly, I'm feeling very insecure about those kinds of odds. Help me out. Yeah, like, is so, it, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to hopefully help you out. Don't think about any of those decisions as individual decisions. Think that over the course of your life, you're making lots and lots and lots of those decisions. And if across all of those decisions, you're always 55, 45, you're going to be really great at the end of your life. That's number one. Hmm. Number two, don't forget that not making a decision is a decision in and of itself. So when you're sitting there and you're trying to think, am I going to be this or that as a business? You're already something. Right. So by not actually being willing to go through the process and say that if I think that this is 55 and this is 45, um, like let's let's take this as an example. Let's say that you're thinking about uh, what were the two choices that you had again in terms of. Let's say business? I'm just I'm pulling it out of a hat, yeah. but let's say strategy execution versus executive coaching. OK, great. So let's say it's strategy ex- ex- execution versus executive coaching. And let's say that you are already a, a strategy execution company. And what you're trying to do is say, maybe we should be focusing more on executive coaching. Well, you're already, every single day that you continue being a strategy execution company is a day that you're continuing to decide to do that. And I think that we forget that. We think that the thing we're already doing is not a decision in and of itself. Right. And we're only afraid of the bad outcome if we make a new choice. Right. Right. But the thing is that if you just sort of never get, like, let's say that you say, well, I need to be 70% instead of 55% in order to switch to a, a leadership uh, company uh, and like an executive coaching, co- coaching company. And so, but you never get to 70%. And so you just continue down the status quo path and your business fails because of it. You're not as sad because you don't feel like you actually made a decision. You didn't take a risk, but But you did. But you did did make a decision. But you did, right. Every single day. Right. So when you're in those moments where you're trying to decide between two paths, you need to view what you're already doing as a new decision. And the thing is that if I presented you with a new decision and I said one's 55 and one's 45, you would always take the 55. But somehow, because 
you set a bar for yourself and the thing you're already doing, you're only at 45% on, but you think to switch courses, you have to be 70. Right. Right. Now you've headed down this thing that's only going to work 45% of the time. And the only reason why you're doing it is because you feel like if you fail as a result of it, it doesn't feel as bad because you didn't change course. Right. So what we want to do is treat it as a new decision. And then what we want to say is we have option A, option B. What are the scenarios that are likely to occur from that? And how do we figure that out? One is prospectively. We just think like, what are, what are the scenarios that we, we think will, are likely to occur from A versus B? Obviously taking into account the resources that you have, right? Like you don't want to think about a scenario that occur, could occur if you had unlimited resources to be in, able to invest. You have to be realistic about that. And then when you figure out what those scenarios are, actually take a stab at putting uh, likelihoods on those. Like how likely do I think that this great outcome is going to occur? It can mm -hmm. be a range. Right. Right. It could be, I think this, the, the best outcome is going to occur 25 to 35% of the time. I think that a pretty good outcome is going to occur, you know, 40 to 60% of the time. Right. You sort of figure that right. out and just, just sort of try to put likelihoods on those things. Now, before you go any further, do this. Define for yourself what success for your company is at the end of whatever that strategic planning period is, say three years. Mm -hmm. Pretend like you're holding up a newspaper and it's three years from now and it's our company has achieved our goal. Have everybody in the room independently write down five reasons they think they achieved that goal. But now this is really important. You have to do a different thing. So that's called a backcast. It's called backcasting, mm -hmm. working backwards from a really good result. But now you have to do this other thing. Imagine that you're holding up the newspaper and it's our company has failed to achieve our goal mm -hmm. and have everybody do the exact same thing. And what that does is two things. It reveals to you different ways that you could fail that you hadn't even thought of. And while that might feel uncomfortable to people, mm -hmm. how great is that? Because it hasn't happened yet. So it gives you a chance to set up some of those rules and contracts that we talked about when we were just talking about restaurants, about how you can actually reduce the likelihood of those particular paths that might lead to failure, or those particular actions that might lead to failure. It allows you to anticipate some things that are, aren't in your control. Like, for example, if, you're, um, if you make a pivot and you're doing executive coaching and the stock market happens to crash, that's obviously going to have a big effect on your executive coaching uh, business. And there's nothing, there, it wasn't anything that had to do with your decisions that you made. But because you've thought about that in advance, you can have a plan, a pivot already ready. Right. So that you're not just being reactive and saying, oh, no, now what do I do? Because the market just crashed. You're like, aha, I thought about this in advance. And here's my plan. I already considered and it. And there's good reason to think about it because you look at – because part of your decision-making process, I guess – would be to look at the stock market and say we've had a bull market for six years and it continues to go up and it thinks, seems like things are overvalued and it's volatile. So there's a, you know, even if it's not a determining factor, maybe it's not a 70% chance, even if it was a 40% chance that the right. stock market would crash, that goes into your decision-making process. That now goes into your decision-making. So the first thing that that so people are really uncomfortable imagining that they failed because they think that they're, that means they're not being a team player. They're not like rah rah in the enterprise. But when you act, it's the actual imagining of the failure that helps you avoid failure. It helps you to sort of see the landscape ahead of you more clearly, things that you might have missed that might be hiding behind uh, you know, barriers and barricades. Generally, the barriers are your own biases, right. the things that you personally can't see because your mind doesn't really want to imagine them. And now you can sort of see those and you can actually put plans in place in advance in order to reduce the probability of those happening. Or if you don't have any control over whether those happen, it helps you put plans in place to, re to, to actually be nimble as opposed to reactive. And then the other thing it does is after you've done that process, go back and think about the likelihood of the good and bad results that happen from each decision because you're probably going to change your probabilities after you've done that. And, and now you've got this great view of the landscape. And what's included in that landscape is that when I go and I do this pivot in my business, or if I stay the course, I now know because I've done the work that sometimes it won't turn out well. Right. And that's okay because nothing ever turns out well 100% of the time. That's totally impossible. I just need to do my best to really map out 
what that future looks like as best as I can. And is there a rule of thumb, and it probably relates to the size of the decision, but is there a rule of thumb as to when you say, I've got enough information at this point to make a call as to the 55, 45%, meaning like, I, I imagine I know that I might get to the 55, 45, and then I might say, okay, let me see if I could find more information that might change those numbers a little bit that might nudge the 55 up to a 65 or a 60, or might inform and might say, actually, we're really 50, 50. And then we're stuck. Like, how do you know, was there a rule of thumb as to when you might decide you have enough information and you've got the percentages that you make your decision based on those. Yeah, so I think it, it, it actually goes back to what I said about maybe you ask the waiter, mm -hmm. right? So um, I th there's, a, there's a couple of things. First of all, you, wanna, you always want to ask yourself, if this doesn't work out, do I get another crack at it? Okay, right. because if you can get another crack at it, you don't need to go as much. You don't need to go as deep into the process. So it's right. the, the idea of like if I could – if I'm ordering in a restaurant, if it doesn't work out, I get another crack at it. Right. Right. Um, so uh, you want to think about things that really take you out of the game completely so that you won't actually get another try at it. And those, obviously, you want to have like a much more in-depth process. You want to be much more uh, making sure that you're really poking the nest right. to, to, to sort of make sure that you understand kind of what you can do and maybe what you can do to protect yourself against that downside where you actually get taken out of the game. Can you hedge against it? You want to be asking yourself those stuff. Whereas like taking your, you know, your whole life to order something on a menu is kind of silly because if it doesn't work out, you get another try at it in a right. few hours. Right. Right. So, so first of all, always ask yourself that question. Um, and then now ask yourself the next question when you've got yourself in a situation where you seem to be having a favorite develop a relatively clear favorite develop because mm -hmm. like 55, 45 is a pretty clear favorite. And ask yourself that question. Is there some piece of information that I could un uncover in the time period that I have to make this decision? Right? So if we're talking about a strategic shift in a company, that right. time period is an infinity because you're already executing a particular strategy. Right. right? So right. whatever it might be, let's say that you've given yourself a month to decide or three months for the planning process or whatever it is. Right. So within the time that we have to complete this planning process, are, is there any information, it could be more than one piece of information, that we feel like we could uncover that would fundamentally change our minds about this? Now, obviously, if you're 50 to 48, you're, there's much more likely, it's much more likely there's going to be information that might change your mind than if you're 70, 30. Right. 70, 30 is a much bigger hurdle to overcome. It would have to be a pretty world shattering a thing that you would find out that would cause you then to flip to the thing that used to be 30%. Right. If it's 50 to 48, yeah, there might be some stuff and you might want to think about what haven't we thought of yet. Can we talk to somebody who really thinks that the other way is important and actually have a really deep discussion with them? Right. Because I think that that might be really valuable information for us to understand why they're a naysayer on this, for example. What is the information that they're thinking about that's causing them to think differently? about this than us. So like if you're like 52, 48 and there's somebody else who's 70, 30 the other way, what a valuable person to go talk to because they might be able to reveal information right. to you that you haven't even thought about. Which is why right? you really want to talk to people who are certain, but you don't necessarily want to just do what they say. You want to explore right. what makes them certain so you can figure out what they're valuing and the kind of percentages that they're, you know, like what's feeding their percentages. Yeah. So like, I mean, here's the extreme example of that. Even if you think that somebody is wrong, it's still really good to talk to them. Right. And the reason is that it helps you understand your own truth better so that you really understand. So I, I use the example of I believe that the earth is round, but it's still okay for me to talk to somebody who's a flat earther mm -hmm. because even though I think they're wrong, it forces me to be able to defend my position. Right. And if I can't defend that position, it's not really truth anymore. It's just dogma that's been passed down to me. Right. 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 So – I want to be able to think about when I'm talking to a flat earther, someone who really has conviction that the earth is flat, I want to now be able to defend my argument. I want to be able to tell them why that's, why that's not true. Right. So it's really good. It's much more valuable to talk to somebody who disagrees with you than talk to somebody who agrees with you. Because if we both agree that the earth is round, we're not making each other defend that position. Right. At least not in any real way. Right. But if we go talk to somebody who thinks that the earth is flat, now we have to. 
right? Which we need a lot more of because everybody's used to talking to each other and, you know, everyone who agrees with them. Right. Uh, um, you know, it's, you, you've, there's so much amazing stuff here, Annie, and I'm so appreciative that you're on the show. And one of the, um, one of the gifts, like as you, as you even just frame this in terms of choices in the context of uncertainty is I think the way a lot of people make decisions is that they'll look at both choices and they'll lament what they have to give up by choosing one versus the other. Meaning, yeah, I think this is the right choice, but I'm not going to get this or I'm not going to get that or I'm not going to get that. And that's what paralyzes us. And what you're saying in clear terms is there is basically no decision you're going to make that doesn't involve giving stuff up. And so it's right. not about the perfect choice. It's about percentages and move on. Yeah, I mean, there. there every single choice that we make has opportunity costs involved right. with it. And the reason is that when, like, like I said, like, let's say that, you know, you're trying to choose among movies, right? Well, during that two hours, there's only one movie I can see. So, but even not choosing to go to a movie is giving up something. It's right. giving up the opportunity to go to the movie right. and going to the movie is giving up the opportunity. You're forgoing all the other things you could be doing with those two hours. Right. So there's no way to get around that problem. Right. Like we, we aren't, we can't, you know, duplicate ourselves. Like we're living in a multiverse where we get to exercise every single option that we ever have. At some point you just have to exercise the option. And of course, when you exercise the option, you're giving up a lot of other options. So I'm but that's curious, still everything. and I'm curious for you. This is a personal question now. I'm curious for you if, if you're going through life and you're making these decisions, and literally there's numbers in your head, and you're going forty-five, fifty-five, uh, and and you're kind of very efficiently making decisions based on percentage chances of successes. You know, not the big decisions, but sort of the everyday decisions. Whether you now, the way an architect looks at a piece of paper and sees a building, whether you look at decisions and, and see the numbers behind them and make choices that way, or do you have sort of an, uh, an instinctive feel of, of directions you're going for most decisions? So I think that a lot of this, when you've been practicing this type of thinking, becomes automatic. Second nature, so, unconsciously yeah, so competent. Yeah, so I, I don't know that you're necessarily uh, explicitly executing on that. But the thing that I'm always willing to do is even when I make these these decisions that are more automatic is allow somebody to challenge me on it. Right. Because I have this big belief that it should never stop with your gut. Right. That in other words, if I say if you if you ever say to me like, oh, well, how come you made that decision? And my answer is, well, my intuition told me to do that, that that should not be an acceptable answer to you. Right. That you should force me to actually be able to explain it in a way where you understand it. Uh, and maybe you could incorporate my thinking into into your thinking, and that makes me hold my intuition up back to a rational process. Right. So I think you practice these really kind of like rational, probabilistic ways of thinking that really embrace the uncertainty in the world. That gets put into these more, you know, it sort of becomes part of your more intuitive processes. Right. But then what you have to do is be willing to do to bring your intuitive processes back up to the light of day sometimes. Right. Um, and then there are certain ways that you can sort of make sure that that's getting reinforced all the time. So, um, like just as an example, somebody asked me if I could just, I, I could come speak in California and I was looking at my schedule and the schedule had a hole in it. And so it looked like I could, and it was something that I really wanted to do. Uh, but it was also like kind of close to the holidays. So I wanted to take that into account. So I wrote them back and I said, well, right now I'm 87%. Let me know when you need me to be more. Um, and the thing is that that's just a way to sort of reinforce this kind of thinking. Right. And aren't I doing a nice thing for him? Because I'm not giving him a yes or no. He didn't need one at that point. Right. I'm actually allowing him to plan better because he understands how likely I actually am right. to do it. Because how many times has someone committed to you and then they just flake out on you? Right. Right. So it would be nice if instead of that, they said like, well, right now, um, like 87 percent to do that, ask, you know, but but let me know when you need me to tell you for sure. Yes or no. Right. And now you can actually plan accordingly around that. So I, I sort of make these markets all the time around things. And it'll be silly things like, you know, uh if if you're reading, a, you know, you're reading an opinion piece and I'm talking to my husband and. I'll say something about like, well, I really agree with that. And they'll say, well, what's your, he'll say like, what's your price? 
And what he's saying to me is, how often do you really think that what they said is true? Right. And then I have to just offer a price back. And it, it just is constantly reminding you that when you speak in this language that's about being sure or that's absolute or that's very black and white, that that's not actually the way the world works. You know, and it's funny because we look at leaders sometimes who seem so sure and people are attracted to those leaders because they see the world in black and white. But and, and we also sometimes look at people, you know, I think of like the Carter presidency. You, you, you're, you're probably too young to remember it, but the Carter presidency where – you know, there was a real sense of him as a waffler and et cetera, and, and, and seeing too much nuance and then preventing action. And I think one of the things that you're saying that I really, really love is that, like, you, you um, uncertainty is not inaction. Right. That, that action takes place in the context of uncertainty. And in fact, action in certainty is a little scary because it means that you're not seeing a whole lot of things. Right. But and and inaction in uncertainty is bland and and leads us to stick with the old choices and forget that they're even choices. But action in the context of uncertainty is how we move powerfully in the world. Yeah, so I think I think that's such a good summary and what I would say to sort of put it in one sentence is don't conflate confidence and certainty. And I think this is where we, we have a problem, right, is that we think that if we acknowledge uncertainty that somehow we'll be perceived as not confident. And that just happens to be because a lot of people who are confident out in the world express things as sure things, right? And a lot of people who are kind of wafflers, you know, don't seem very confident in their decisions. So what you want to do is actually come in the middle. So like an example would be if I say to you, okay, we've been considering strategy A and strategy B, and I really, strategy A is 70%. Here's why I think strategy A is 70% to work. Here's why I think strategy B is 30% to work. So it's very clear we should go with strategy A, and this is my strong recommendation. Did I say anything without confidence? <laughs> no, no, you were very confident, and we don't have certainty, but very confident. Because it, and, and the thing is that exactly as you just said, if you think that confidence and certainty are the same thing so that you express things in a black and white way, I don't want you as a leader right. because it means that you have a very poor model of the world. Right. And I think that the people who make the best decisions are people who have a really accurate model of the world and, and who are willing to – it's that thing I, – I can't remember who, who said it, but it's that uh, – maybe it was Charlie Munger who said uh, – or Warren Buffett who said, we have strong convictions – weekly help. Right, right. Right. So so what that means is that in the moment that we're deciding, we're very, very sure of our decision based on our knowledge right then. Right. But if you tell me something new that would fundamentally change my mind, I'll okay. Right. Right. I'm open minded to that. Annie, I, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it has been to have this conversation with you. And it's it's I know it will directly impact my life and my stress levels in terms of making decisions, right? Because I, I can make these decisions now with less stress, knowing that the outcomes are uncertain, but I'm making still good and strong decisions. Annie Duke, her book is Thinking in Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. It has been such a tremendous pleasure to talk with you. A a evidence of that, and I'm sorry, is that I doubled the length of our normal podcast. <laughs> then, you know, I, I promised you I'd get you out in 25 minutes and I couldn't stop That's talking okay. with you. So, so it's been, you know, a total joy. And thank you so much for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. All right. Well, thank you.